and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. And today we are talking about sustainable tourism and travel with GSTC. And we have a manager of the Asia Pacific Japan region, Emi Kaiwa. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. Oh, it's great to have you here. Now, Emmy, uh, you were saying that you've been with the Global、uh, Sustainable Tourism Council, GSTC,、uh, for about eight years since 2016.、Mm -hmm. Is that right?、Uh, yes. Yeah. Time flies. It's so fast. This、uh, eight years, but、uh, it's really a great experience I've been having with GSTC. Now, before that,、uh, your experience was in. Italy, Sardinia, Italy.、Mm -hmm. uh, you were working for Pacific Asia Travel Association.、Um, you got your MBA in tourism in Thailand. You are a global citizen and now、mm -hmm. focused in Japan. So, how has your, your interest, like where did your interest in travel or sustainable travel, where did that come from? Yeah, thank you for asking. It's actually something, it's a, like um, um, really,、uh, I had a turning point in my life a lot. And then, especially when I was in Kenya, in Africa,、um, in 2008, after finishing the school,、um, I was interested in actually not the tourism at the beginning. I was more interested in child labor issues and development of economy in developing countries. So, I, I traveled to South Africa and Ken,、uh, I traveled to South Africa once, and then I decided to work in Africa. And then I found the job,、uh, which is the, as a tour consultant in,、uh, at the landing,、uh, land operator、uh, in Kenya. So, I started to work there and living there, and then I stayed there about four and a half years there. So, the, at, at, in Kenya, I learned starting from ecotourism because they are,、um, you know, beautiful wildlife and nature is as a tourism asset related to their life very much. So, I felt powerless because as an individual, I couldn't make much changes.、Um, so, I was researching, talking to people, and Um, and then I found the beautiful concept of the sustainability. So,、uh, as you may know, that the triple bottom line economy, economy, economy and environment and social、uh, sometimes people say different w a y like、uh, people, planet. So, but、uh, those concepts itself a s very rational w a y of thinking. So, it really f i t me in my life,、um, not only about the sustainable tourism, but really fitting in my life. And then I like to travel and then see the world, learn new things. So, if I can do something in sustainability through tourism, it would be the best career I can take and start. And,、uh, and then at that time, there are not so many sustainable tourism professionals、uh, in Asia region. And I knew that Asia will grow in many ways, economically and populations. So, I thought it was a good chance for me to start、uh, at that time. Yeah, fantastic. And you、mm -hmm. also have experience working with the WWF, the World、mm -hmm. Wildlife Foundation.、Uh, what was that like? What can you tell us, like your biggest takeaway from your work with WWF?、Mm -hmm. uh, maybe connected to your time with ecotourism in Kenya. Did you、mm -hmm. see the value of protecting animals as part of tourism?、Mm -hmm. Yeah,、uh, so at the WWF Japan,、uh, when I was working, I was working for like coordinating with the、uh, corporation who, are, who wants to contribute to environment conservation and then、uh, society. So we received a donation from them and how they can promote their self. So that was a main task I had. And then in WWF Japan,、um, we Uh, they didn't have some tourism uh, activities uh, related to sustainability. It's, in WWF, it's more like、uh, WWF US is、uh, having, taking initiative to do something through tourism、uh, with sustainability. So,、uh, but when I was in Kenya, I didn't have a chance to interact with the WWF、uh, Kenya office at that time. Um, but uh, uh, I think they probably they are、um, 
uh, more communicating with the wildlife, uh, like allengers at the wildlife. But like I said at the beginning, that uh, uh, those their wildlife is a tourism asset. So it's very important to protect because it's directly connected uh, to the life of the uh, local people. So for example, like whom I was working with, the dr driver at the safari drive, uh, they really care about uh, uh, wildlife and natures to protect because if there are so many people coming into the uh, conservation, it will damage to the uh, wildlife animals and then the natures and then also the people also live there like some tribes. But um, they, um, you know, uh, kind of they can bring money uh, because they can attract the people and then people will pay for the fee, park fee. And then um, also the uh, tips to the drivers if they are good at to guide uh, the tourist. But if there is no asset, which is a wildlife and beautiful nature, they cannot survive. They cannot send their kids to the school. They cannot, you know, eat food. So it's so related. So without thinking the concept of sustainability for this dr drivers, for example, uh, they are already doing it because it's already related to their economy, which is sustainability. So it's very rational. Um, so the um, uh, coming back to the uh, WWF experience in Japan. So I learned more like uh, not really some tourism aspect, but the business aspect in uh, WWF Japan, how the business people are thinking about the sustainability and the environment. Uh, what I realized was that, uh, of course, because I was working for WWF, they are more like environmental aspect focused than uh, the whole concept of the sustainability. So I had to explain that when they speak about the SDGs, uh, it's not only about the environmental aspect, they need to also think about the social and also economy that's related to their business directly. Um, so I, I, it was a really good experience. I learned a lot about how Japanese cooperation is thinking uh, about towards the, the SDGs and sustainability. That really um, helped me to understand the tourism businesses in Japan. Yeah, that's so important. And like what you said about uh, they weren't the drivers, for example, of the eco tours in Kenya. They weren't specifically thinking about sustainability. But if you let the animals die out or they're not protected or the environment is not protected, they lose their jobs. But also the local economy is affected. Their culture is affected. So I'm sure these four pillars, which you have as the GSTC, these are so interconnected it's sometimes really hard to separate each one because they all connect and are important for each other right yeah definitely it is so yeah can you tell us a little bit about the gstc so that what are the four pillars of the uh, global sustainable tourism council yeah so the uh, we so first of all the GSCC uh, was the uh, established in two thousand seven, so jointly supported by UN agency and international NGOs and managing the GSCC criteria, which is uh, consists of popular uh, economical aspect, environmental aspect, and then uh, social uh, social uh, economy, and then the uh, cultural aspect. And uh, I forgot for environment. Yeah, no. Yeah, so I said so. <laughs> yeah, the so sustainable, according to the website, sustainable management, yes, socio economic <laughs> impact, culture yeah. and community, and environmental impact. Yeah. And like we said, all all interconnected, of course. Yes, right? yes, yeah. all interconnected. Sorry, I was a bit nervous. So the <laughs> so based on this popular, uh, we. Um, we developed the standard, global standard for sustainable travel and tourism, as well as providing the international accreditation for sustainable tourism certification bodies. Uh, but uh, currently we have the uh, GSTC criteria for industry, which is uh, divided into the um, 
hotel, and then the twelve ladders, uh, it, which is the diff- same criteria but the different indicators for hotel and then the twelve uh, ladder, and then also GSDC, the GSDC for destination, destination criteria we have, and uh, uh, recently uh, this year February we announced the new criteria, the mice criteria we have. And currently, we are establ- uh, developing the new criteria for attraction. And also, we recently started the criteria for the food and beverage. So now, a lot of uh, new criteria is going on. And then uh, we we got the blunt, um, volunteers to translate for the different uh, languages for GSTC criteria for industry and destination, many languages already available on uh, on our website. It's for free to download. And then now we are welcoming a lot of volunteers to translate to MICE criteria. And then after um, the new criteria development, uh, we welcome them, uh, anyone to translate uh, in different languages. And uh, we are also a membership council and uh, we have like around uh, six, six hundred, currently 600, around 50 plus uh, globally members we have. And then um, actually we have many members from Asia after Europe. And uh, we have the most members from Japan in Asia Pacific region now. We had a great comment uh, just now from Natasha. Thanks for joining mm-hmm. on YouTube saying you're doing great. So a little bit of positive comments, yeah. I, Emmy, I'm, I'm just so respect and I, inspired by you. You are multilingual, uh, doing this interview in English. So thank you so much. Oh. I know it's, it's not your native language, but you're mm-hmm. awesome. And speaking of how wonderful you are at languages, uh, you have a talk coming up at the GSTC conference in Singapore. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about what, what will you be talking about at the conference? Yes, uh, so actually uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to be a moderator. So we will invite uh, some speakers from Japan. So this time uh, conference in Singapore in November, uh, we will have a lot of Japanese delegates, which makes me really happy. And then, um, so the, uh, we are going to discuss about how Japan as a country uh, start taking initiative for sustainable tourism, starting from destination in Japan, and then how the government um, started the project for sustainability, and then how it influenced to the destination, uh, like municipalities, and also the uh, stake, uh, tourism businesses, like large companies and then small entities, tourism businesses, how it relates to the um, action uh, which was by the Japanese government, and then how it influenced to the companies, businesses. So those uh, topics we are going to discuss. I think it was 13th to 15th of November. Oh. And Singapore uh, has a lot of wonderful initiatives happening. Um, I have talked to a few people uh, who rave about uh, what's happening with sustainable tourism in Singapore, such a small country. Um, but always very innovative uh, place. So it'll be a wonderful place to talk about sustainable tourism in Japan. Now you uh, mentioned the three criteria. So what uh, GSTC is focused on is destinations, helping destinations become more sustainable, helping industry, for example, hotels, places to stay, uh, restaurants become more sustainable and MICE, uh, which is event uh, places or big, big groups, big travel groups uh, for conferences and things. Um, And you mentioned there's 600 global members and in the Asia region, uh, you have the most Japanese members. Uh, That's great to hear. Uh, For the Japan chapter, Uh, What kinds of things are you doing? It looks like you have a lot of training seminars, um, trying to get more people into the certification scheme. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you do in Japan? Sure, thank you. So um, 
the like I said that the um, Japan government really supported for the destination to grow towards the sustainability. So they sponsored GSTC training. So GSTC training is learning about uh, our GSTC criteria uh, for this industry and destination. It's combined. So it's a bit difficult to just to read the standard itself and to understand everything. But our uh, GSTC trainer uh, explained to the trainees that, that the example of each criterion. So it will be easier for the um, trainees to understand. So um, those training we have been conducting uh, sponsored by uh, Japan Tourism Agency for some years in Japan. So that's really uh, influenced to the industry and the municipalities. So past a few years, we were uh, that was sponsored, but from uh, last year, they um, decreased the sponsorship for the training, but still the number of the training conducting in Japan remains the same, which is great because the municipalities and then the companies, they want to invest the money for taking the training for their employees and then their people in their destination because they, they think this is important to learn. So this is a really great achievement what Japan as a government did for uh, uh, for them to be independently thinking about their sustainability by their own. So this is one thing what we were um, doing, the training. Uh, the I think within the uh, globally, the Japan as a con one country is also the most um, conducting the training, <laughs> in on-site training. It's, it's a lot of training we are doing. And then uh, secondly, Maybe we, I can say that now the, uh, in terms of the certification, especially for the hotel, we are trying to grow the um, GSTC certification for the hotel because if destination wants to be a sustainable destination, they cannot achieve without the cooperation from the industry, tourism industry. And then especially for the, one, uh, the hotels, because if the tour agent wants to um, create a sustainable tourism tour, for example, without a certified hotel, it's very difficult to, to have it, right? As a product, it's difficult to have. So it's kind of the starting point to change the hotel. So now uh, in the Japan market, we are trying to have maybe raise awareness first because the destination uh, first, the maybe lays the awareness of the sustainability and then to our agent also, but hotels are a bit still uh, slow. So now we are trying to um, encourage more hotels to be aware about the sustainable uh, towards GSTC certification and towards to the um, to gain the certification for of the GSTC. It's so important. Yeah. Uh, now now I saw that uh, you're you're in the speaker lineup for the Singapore conference. Uh, your profile is right next to the CEO of GSTC, uh, mm -hmm. Randy Durvand. And on the website, you can see a lot of information if you're interested. Uh, interviews with Randy and a lot of the ideas. And one of the thing that he said in his interview on the website is um, GSTC was created by UN agencies. Uh, there, you. One of your main missions is to fight against false claims or greenwashing, and I'm sure uh, you know, as I see as well as doing sustainable consulting in Japan for tourism, uh, we see a lot of claims which are not very sustainable, but it's kind of promoted as green. Now, how? What is one strategy that you are using at GC? um tc to combat greenwashing what can what can you do uh to try to make it more clear this is sustainable mm, this is not really sustainable like how what any strategy that you're using um good question and difficult question i think because i, I cannot say like one strategy to combat those uh false claim and then not only the tourism industry but also other industry is, you know, trying to fight with those uh, false claims. So maybe not only about GSTC or tourism itself, but um, 
what we have been doing is keep uh, <laughs> trying to correct the misleading uh, expression. So um, the accurate explanation of the certification, accreditation, uh, those are very technical terminology to be uh, delivered correctly. So we work hard to correct, but you know it's so difficult to make everyone to understand the certification world, for example, because this is not the tourism things. So certification world itself is pretty different from tourism itself. So not all the tourism stakeholders to understand to all the you know details, technical uh, terminology in the certification world. So we are we keep trying to uh, correct the uh, in the correct way of um, uh, those um, expressions, but um, it's. It's, it looks like uh, no end <laughs> to, to, uh, to correct uh, those term, uh, expressions. But uh, um, I think we just need to keep doing it. And then at some point, the, I think all the people, stakeholders uh, related to, for example, like a tourism certification will be leveled up, lift up about the knowledge, knowledge about the certification and then like a common uh, standard understanding, common understanding will be changing. So at that point, probably uh, more easier <laughs> to see that the correct expression in the market, I hope. I think, I think that's true. I think what you are doing with the certification programs, with working with partners who actually do the certification, and then you do the accreditation of those partners that are doing certification, uh, you're doing training. So you're doing so much to raise awareness in Japan and other countries about what are the benchmarks between Japan or your destination and other destinations abroad. And I think this is so important. And Emmy, this is where your experience working abroad and working in different countries is so valuable because you have a much wider view of what's happening in other countries around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yes, it's really, uh, it was really great experience that um, I exposed a lot uh, when I was younger. So I got a lot of different perception from maybe instead of just um, living and working uh, in Japan. Um, of course, I am comfortable living in Japan and working in Japan now, but it was really a good experience to uh, see the world. Mm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, so one of the, the missions is training programs, education and awareness, and promoting and setting global standards uh, for what is sustainable tourism, like you said, and how can you improve? And I think I because I was teaching as an academic for 21 years and then transitioning to become a consultant and working with people and businesses and destinations that are trying but you have to kind of talk to them where they are, like mm -hmm. not talk to them about this amazing standard somewhere else, right? Like where mm -hmm. are they? Are they trying? What are they doing which is good? And what are they doing which could be a little bit better? Like incremental small changes. Is that mm -hmm. kind of your strategy as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, definitely. So I think this is somehow related to the self-assessment. We um, encourage to the like a trainees. So when the when we have a GSTC uh, training, sustainable tourism training course, after they learned uh, what is the GSTC criteria, they can check by themselves uh, following the uh, GSTC criteria whether each criterion whether they, how much they can do how much they are doing what and then what is the example what you are doing now for related to the uh, one of the criterion so those self-assessment is very important to understand uh, which level stage you are in 
So it's the same thing when you start talking with a, a new person who are kind of interested in sustainability or SDGs. Uh, for example, in Japan, it's more popular terminology. So um, you need to really listen first, understand that uh, where they are, how much they are understanding about sustainability or environment, what's their interest. So from that, um, in the same, um, so some communication always needs to be uh, to be used that the, the word that they understand. So it's not about using a difficult tec technical terminology, but you know. Uh, so yes, like you said, that is kind of my strategy to uh, understand first uh, who they are and then what uh, stage they are, and then start from what they can do. And then that's uh, something they feel they achieved one thing they achieved, they can level up next. So we don't have to, of course, some of the things we need to push a lot uh, quickly, because for example, like a 20, uh, 2030 is very soon. <laughs> so some of the things we need, really need to push uh, quickly, but um, um, we have to, um, we cannot force them to do something for the sustainability because this is all about their selves to, you know, for their sustainability, for their life. So um, that, that point, I always try to uh, make it clear for them to understand. That's such a good point. And I think uh, like booking.com who joined uh, your uh, sustainable council in 2019, um, they did, they always do interesting research every year and one of the research that they did this year was about motivation of travelers to travel more sustainably. And it was a little bit sad because it looked like people are not really looking for sustainability as much as previous surveys. But one of the silver linings is that they are uh, feeling more value once they do find sustainable travel, they feel more like a rewarding, it's more rewarding travel for them. And they bring this positive feeling back when they finish their travel. So in that way, building a more sustainable destination or a more sustainable tourism business or creating a better, more sustainable event it has more brand value. So that might be more motivation for people to try to do the self-assessment, to try to do the training programs, to try to do certification with your organization, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So uh, I think uh, if as um, in the tourism industry, as a service provider for the travelers, uh, the more we provide the sustainable products, the more awareness raising up by the travelers. And then that, that, that is the time that they actually realize the value of the sustainability or that is the time actually they got to know first time about sustainability itself and it's fitting them to make them happy because they didn't know about this beauty of the something good for the planet and then uh, without, you know, before traveling, maybe travelers didn't know about it. And then when they were searching to plan the, the travel to somewhere, they found those sustainability products. And then there is some story, story, uh, line, storytelling uh, from those tours. And then they realized this is very valuable. So those things would be uh, really ideal, I think because I believe that um, all the human beings on this planet cannot really consider about the sustainability, all of us. It will be very nice if all of the human beings could think about that, but I think it's, it's not uh, realistic. So um, we really need to, uh, I think, control or uh, systemize the, um, uh, to make people uh, towards the sustainability without unconsciously. So. Uh, I think those things are very important. And then the uh, tourism itself has a role to uh, make those systems uh, in a good way. Absolutely. 
I agree. And I, I would love to talk with you about some of the key words um, that you use in Japan to connect with the understanding that people already know as a part of Japanese culture. So, for example, motainai, don't waste, mm. or satoyama, the idea of the rural areas living in balance with nature. Um, are there certain key words like that, like motainai or satoyama, which you use when you're talking with Japanese members or Japanese training programs, which people understand deeply in Japanese culture, which helps them understand sustainable tourism a little bit better? Mm, okay, that's a good point. I, I didn't, uh, I don't think we've used a lot about uh, specifically those motainai or satoyama when I'm talking with uh, Japanese members. But I think actually it's really good to introduce that kind of concept or even the Japanese terminology to the different audience in the different countries. That 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 is actually originally we have that kind of concept already before we were start talking about SDGs or sustainability. Yeah, tip. <laughs> yeah, of course. I found that really useful uh, mm. in training programs or in consultations. That that is a good point of reference. And maybe this generation, people in Japan don't really think about it so much, but everybody says, oh, my grandma, she always did motainai, or she always was talking about sustainability. You know, like my, my grandma would never waste anything, right? So maybe the generation before us, the elders in Japan, maybe they really deeply practiced these these like lifestyle habits of sustainability, but maybe our current generation in Japan maybe lost a little bit because of modernization, mm. right? Mm. Um, so it's always a nice cultural point of reference, I think. Mm, that's true. Sometimes I joke with my like colleagues uh, in Japan that uh, probably in Japan, if we go back to the Edo era. Uh, that everything is so sustainable. <laughs> it's like a perfect situation that we had a really sustainable lifestyle at that time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I interviewed an amazing author. Uh, he's a designer and professor in Japan in Tokyo named Asby Brown. And he wrote a beautiful book called Just Enough about the Edo period and the reuse of everything. Uh, in Japanese society at the time. So it's a wonderful book. I would mm -hmm. I would highly recommend. Yeah, mm, thank you. Yeah, I would love yeah. to read. Good. Um, now, could you tell us a few of the case studies or a few examples um, which is happening in Japan or in the Asia region, which is really uh, a really positive example of sustainable tourism in action or uh, talk about some of the hurdles that you're finding in this area? Um, maybe uh, not specific case studies, but um, probably I can talk about um, the, the project the Japanese government did to sponsor first for the training, uh, made a really good achievement after a few years to influence to the municipalities and then uh, tourism industry make them aware but this is something really worked for the japanese culture japanese government so i cannot apply all the country uh, but maybe in the asia region i think it will work well um, because of the the culture maybe top down system um, if you compare to the maybe european uh, culture style a little bit different so maybe uh, the other countries could refer those um, uh, um, like um, those um, way of changing the market um, and then also the um, this um, the sustainability movement uh, really um, become really uh, promoted in Japan makes uh, tourism industry really change so now the a lot like i said a lot of japanese members in asia regions so we have about uh, more than 20 uh, organization members in japan 
And then uh, since last year, we started to have a workshop. So only Japan members, Japanese uh, GSTC members got together by themselves, not like GSTC said that, oh, let's have a, a meeting for Japan because we don't do that in different countries. Globally, we don't do the like a chapter meeting in different countries, but by themselves, they raise their voice and then we should, you know, get together. So make them really um, um, tighten the bond in Japan. So of course, in the same country and in the same business, they can bring a lot of good ideas for sustainability in Japan. So it was a really good opportunity. Um, uh, we started last year and then uh, this year also, uh, we are going to, uh, we, we had in, it was uh, May, we had, and then also um, Randy CEO, GSTC Randy CEO, and then other colleagues also came to Japan. And then uh, we had a workshop. It was really great uh, gathering. And then, um, so, the and also uh, soon in September, yeah, actually this this month we will have a Japan Tourism Expo at Tokyo Big Site from twenty six this month, right? And then uh, we will have the one session about the Japan tourism in sustainability with uh, GSTC members, uh, GSTC organization members. So I will be there, and then my colleagues is going to moderating the session, and they will talk about the sustainability in Japan in Japanese, so to make audience really understand about the GSTC because we are trying to translate to our website to Japanese, some of the page, but we cannot really catch up everything to translate to Japanese. So still a bit less uh, information to Japanese audience, Japanese stakeholders who only speak Japanese. So we thought it would be a really good chance to uh, show our presence in um, Tourism Expo, which is the uh, biggest uh, you know, um, exhibition in, in Japan for tourism. So we will have uh, that. And then uh, hopefully next year, we will have more bigger uh, GSTC uh, presence in those big uh, events. So those things are really um, connected to what we have done in the past few years. And then we were planning from that time already that after a few years, maybe this kind of this situation will change to this way or that way. And then because we have those events, we will uh, maybe plan to approach to them and then speak about to show our presence and then make it more bigger to get more attentions. And then those, uh, you know, specific group of the uh, tourism businesses, stakeholders would change this way. So in that way, we have to talk about this certification body or that um, stakeholders. So we, I think uh, we really think ahead a lot about those, think about those possibility many possibility, maybe some of them will not happen, but uh, we think a lot fast. <laughs> That's why we, our start always uh, slow, most of the time, culturally in Japan, I think. But uh, in a good side is that we think a lot. <laughs> Those yeah. are the oh, that's, some that's wonderful to hear that that's wonderful to hear that you'll be at the Tourism Expo because I went years ago when I was still working at university, I went to that Tourism Expo as part of my research and I was so disappointed that there was hardly anything about sustainable tourism. Mm. It, was, it wasn't even in the consciousness yet. Maybe that's about eight, nine years ago. Um, mm. So that's so wonderful that you'll have a whole session on it. Um, now, one thing I think a lot of visitors um, to Japan don't realize is how strong Japan's domestic tourism is. So, and, you know, like here's information from JTB talking about uh, domestic outbound travelers. So Japanese visitors abroad is rising by 50%. Inbound travelers is 33 million. But... 
Japanese domestic travelers is 97% in 2023. 273 million travelers. And when I went to Hawaii recently, I'm from Hawaii, mm. and I compared which gets more tourism, Hiroshima or Hawaii? What, what's your impression? Which, which place, which destination gets more visitors? Hawaii or uh, Hiroshima? Oh, you mean that that from Japanese, uh, Japanese travelers? No, no, any traveler. Oh, in all? Any um, tourist. Any mm, tourist. Hawaii. Which would get more? Yeah, right. My impression too was Hawaii, but absolutely mm. no. Hiroshima mm. gets more visitors because mm. most of the visitors are domestic travelers. And mm. even if Hawaii gets more domestic travelers, they have to fly to go to Hawaii, where in Hiroshima, you can come by train, you can come by mm. ferry, you can come by bicycle, you can come by air, right? So, of course, you're going to have more. So, I think when we have so many inbound travelers coming to Japan, they have a higher awareness of what is sustainable travel, what is sustainable business, and they're looking for it. But... To be honest, many Japanese tourism destinations or Japanese businesses, it's not really the same level yet. It's a little bit lower level. But mm. your focus is really on developing the sustainable travel in Japanese destinations. So that's mostly hitting Japanese travelers, right? Mm. So what you're trying to do is so important and, and yeah. important. Because yeah. it's not just for the inbound market, right? Yeah, exactly. So that point is really um, important for the Japanese members because Japanese, this GSDC Japanese organization members. So we have JTB um, and also Rakuten. Uh, they are also GSDC members. And then uh, also Booking.com uh, is a uh, GSDC members and they also have the Japan office. So these three um, companies got together and then exactly discussing about how we can raise awareness of the Japanese travelers when they travel domestically or even internationally. So they they focus on that um, uh, to raise awareness about uh, the sustainability for the Japanese traveler. And then they started some campaign, like some slogan using some uh, campaign, they get together and then start the campaign and which they, they have uh, some guidebook or some, how can I say, flyer, maybe flyer that showing that uh, what it means about sustainability, your small action uh, takes it in, into account for the sustainability. So by doing so, um, the end users, consumers can realize that uh, the small steps make some change and then make, make them feel good. And then when they are traveling. So um, I think this is a really good um, um, collaboration between the big, large companies. And then actually they will have the booth. Uh, three three companies um, collaborated and then have a booth at the Tourism Expo in uh, at the Japan, big Tokyo big site. So if yeah, if you are coming, uh, you can stop by. And then uh, I think it's a really good uh, action uh, that they take by yourself. Yeah. That's great news. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always, when I do consulting, I always bring my own water bottle. And I always ask at the destination that we're consulting with, can I fill up my bottle? And that's like a really basic test. Do you have somewhere where people can refill their bottle? Like it's a really low hanging fruit, but it's, it's actually a real challenge in mm. Japan. There mm. are apps like MyMizu, which is an app mm. where you can find free water refills all, all over Japan. But that's mm. something that they can add with very low cost but reduce the waste that they're creating by single-use packaging, for example. Are there other like quite basic, low-level standards that you try to encourage uh, businesses or destinations to implement in Japan or other uh, countries? Yeah, yeah, but uh, globally, uh, we are actually the, um, 
trying to uh, do something about those uh, refill my bottle, my mizu things, the ovary, because that's very basic and then important, like you said, with the low cost. But I think we need some something to drive them to implement immediately some campaign or maybe big or a big company started to do and then promote promote a lot and usually many countries for uh, many companies follow what <laughs> you know someone is um announcing uh, loud so in the communication so I, I think using that um followers uh, that to follow when they see that the big announcement they want to follow so using that uh tactic i think we can uh try to do those my mizu things because i personally really want <laughs> to have those you know uh dispenser or summer sometimes I, I but i saw sometimes like uh uh we work at place like a sharing office place people can just come in even you are not working there, just come in and then refill your water um, bottle. And so I think those are really good idea. And I don't know why it's not really um, yeah, popular. It's, it's not really um, popular like yet in mm -hmm. Japan, but it would improve. It's one of those ideas that it would improve the health of local people as well mm -hmm. as visitors right? Enhance the health, enhance the experience. So uh, Hilton is a national chain, which you can refill at. Muji is another international mm -hmm. chain. So you are starting to see more businesses say, oh, we do it. Of course, Patagonia as well. We do it, come fill up and they're on my music, but also part of their positive branding is about filling up. Now, next, we hope to see JR, and all mm. of the transportation companies to offer right. refills, right? Mm. That would be a big step, yeah? Yes. yes, that would be really great if we can have it in those now, in public. For sure. Uh, let's mm. talk a little bit about the training programs that you were doing. Uh, you did some really interesting ones. Uh, there was one in Shodoshima, for example, on the website that I saw. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what happens at these training uh, seminars in person or online? Uh, in Japan, <clears throat> most of the training are conducted on, on site. So uh, basically training uh, will be three days. And then the first two days, usually we have like um, classroom style and then studying about each criterion. So listening to the explanation uh, by the GSDC trainer with examples, but also they will have a time to discuss each other that um, maybe kind of sometimes maybe role play. And then uh, also the what if uh, this situation happened to your company or to in your position, or what, how will you uh, do? So those things um they are going to discuss in the classroom and then the third day uh they will go to the field work so they go to the site um and then they will listen to the maybe the uh, owner of the one of the uh, tourism uh, attractions and then uh what the challenge to manage the uh, operation and then those things to relate one of the things those experience maybe relate to one of the criteria of gscc uh, for industry for example and then uh after the um those uh, uh site visit they come back to the room and then they discuss again and then if that training is for the destination one specific destination they will also think and plan that uh, how they want to change to their destination based on the GSCC criteria. So those are the basic uh, standard package of the GSCC training on, on site. That's wonderful. Uh, we mm -hmm. had a comment from uh, Benton Homestead. Now they are doing, they're planning to do agritourism uh, on Omishima in Imabari Ehime. 
And uh, I have talked to a few different farmers, organic farmers, who are also really thinking of transitioning to agritourism. Um, that if they're already doing organic farming, adding visits from, from tourists, it makes sense, added revenue, but also uh, sharing a more valuable experience as a part of tourism. Are you, do you know of any other agritourism projects that you're a part of with um, Japan or Asia? I think the, the Ministry of Agriculture is also trying to um, uh, promote because of the people who are um, working for the um, agriculture, for example, like a, a rice field to make the rice. The population of the Japanese people also like decreasing to eat the rice itself as well. And then there are not so many people who want to uh, take over the job as a farmer. So there is a, some problem because rice is very, you know, important uh, things that uh, we are eating as a Japanese uh, traditionally. So it's something somehow related to our culture as well. If and we, it's, it's, not, you know? it's not just food, right? Mm. It's about the landscape. Can you imagine mm. Japan's yeah. landscape without rice farms? No, right? Mm. It's such <laughs> a beautiful and culturally rich part of Japan. Yes, yes. Which is, right? Yes. But uh, probably um, in terms of the promotion, maybe a little bit uh, less that about the agritourism, I think there are um, tourism called oofing that the people, you know, invite tourists to let them stay and then provide the food. Instead, they will work for some farming. So those things uh, could promote more, probably. I know one uh, website um, about the woofing in Japan, in Japanese and Japanese community. I think they are doing it and sometimes they receive some tourists but it's not so much uh, promotion uh, is going on. So maybe uh, using the element of sustainability, more appealing, promoting about this uh, agriculture, pre uh, tourism, and then uh, woofing, staying at the farm, farms, uh, makes it more uh, attractive to the tourist from another country and also the domestic tourism, a uh, domestic tourist, especially like a uh, young people, um, maybe during the university student or after graduate, they are still thinking where to go. So at that time, at that point, probably it's like me, maybe <laughs> I was also, you know, wondering after um, university uh, where to go. And then it was a good opportunity for me to travel different country at, for me, for my case, but also like in different prefecture or different environment makes younger people to think more. And when they are thinking, if they, you know, touch uh, some elements of the sustainability or uh, agro-tourism, it makes some, you know, uh, food to think about their, you know, future. Uh, and then it might relate to those sustainable tourism. So that is also good to um, contribute for the younger generation to because we need a lot of human resource uh, with a good experience uh, for the tourism industry in Japan too. So uh, yeah, I think there are so many things to do. Mm. Lots of lots of potential there. Mm -hmm. Now, where uh, where Danny at Benden Homestead is, she's on along the Shimanami Kaido, mm -hmm. and uh, another woman, a professor at Hiroshima University, uh, Simono, uh, she was doing research on rural tourism and maybe cycle tourism or agritourism or developing. Uh, different Simona Zolet, her research was also in rural Italy and bringing a lot of examples from rural Italy back to rural Japan where she is in Hiroshima. So have you also, with all your world experience, have you thought of ideas that are happening abroad? Oh, maybe that would work in Japan or ideas from Japan that maybe would also work in other countries. Can you think of an example like that? Um, is that the, the uh, Italy uh, rural tourism bringing to the rural area in Hiroshima? Is that the concept of the 
uh, the the village itself became uh, like a tourism destination. I so mean, she, Simona the, was talking about uh, mm -hmm. in rural Italy, you mm -hmm. have similar problems as rural Japan. So mm -hmm. you have a declining farmer community. People are, mm -hmm. are getting out of farming. You have uh, aging population. So mm -hmm. you have more abandoned houses. So, so many similarities between rural Italy and rural Japan. And she, uh, being from Italy, she was always making connections. And I found that so interesting. Uh, I'll put the link below if anybody wants to see mm. that. Uh, but you've you made some connections from your experience in Kenya, for example, um, the Echo Tours there, talking to the drivers. Are there other examples that you would bring to Japan? Maybe would work? Maybe a good idea from your experience? Mm. Put you on the spot here. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I cannot um, think about immediately, but the, from the um, the example of the Italy, I heard that the one of the village uh, in Italy uh, started to um, make like a team or like a company in the one village and then started to make uh, the town, it, uh, the village itself as a, like a hotel or one uh, concept of a tourism um, destination. So not, not really the, exactly the, um, the destination per se, but more like a maybe company or one tourism institute. So when the tourists visit, um, they uh, stay at the one, um, uh, maybe in the past abandoned um, hotel or house, and then they they renovated to the uh, accommodation to sleep in, but there is no space for the kitchen or space for the uh, relaxation. So the another abandoned house in the past renovated for the um, the relaxation place or like having a coffee place, and then they can move a little bit, walk, and then move, but. The, while they are moving, they can see different things in the in the village because the space is like a, the village is big. So it's not only one small uh, hotel to stay is accommodation uh, when you travel to somewhere. But if the traveler stay in that big like kind of hotel, uh, you can enjoy different things with the scenery and different people. So. Basically, everyone living in that village uh, collaborate together, work to be together, cooperate together, and then um, give the service to one uh, tourist to enjoy everything in different places. And, but that makes, brings money to everyone equally. And then uh, do not, uh, so instead of, for example, maybe that village can think that the one um, abandoned hostel, I mean the house, can convert to the um, maybe um, can convert to the big you know um, normal hotel to stay like there is a, a kitchen and a, a space to sleep and then a bathroom and then uh, one one room but instead of doing that they keep the old um, house as it is as much as they can and then also provide the different um, service by the different people so those cons i forgot the name but i think it's quite popular in italy yeah. um, one of the village that concept i think one of the japanese uh Lula Lelia, tried to uh, bring it to you definitely mm. yeah we, we see that concept a little bit in japan right like when mm -hmm. i talked to alex kerr and his uh -huh. developments in ia valley and so mm -hmm. renovating old heritage traditional houses and then having dinner down the road with some grannies uh, or they deliver some food and make it for you there right so getting villages or getting a destination appeal instead of just hotel appeal or one business appeal right mm -hmm. so that's that's definitely something exciting to see for sustainable tourism in Japan, for sure. Thank yeah. you so much, Emmy, for talking and sharing all of your insights today. That Thank is our time, one hour. 
And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you're so busy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was really nice talking to you. So many great ideas you've shared. Thank you so much. And <laughs> good luck with your presentation in Singapore in November <laughs> and for the Tokyo Big Site uh, Tourism Conference. Yeah. I hope it goes well. Thank you.